Now to see what happens, remember how our common filtering in the last unit worked. So we had our landmarks and in every time step we extracted from our laser scan measurements the locations of landmarks which were somehow noisy. But we used the assumed position and orientation of our robot to map those detected cylinders into the world coordinate system and then we looked for landmarks close to these projected positions, so closer than a given radius, and then we assigned those. And each such assignment led to an observation equation in the correction step of our Kalman filter. And so if I don't know where the robot is, I just say it is centered in the middle of the arena, looking, say, in the x-direction, then even though I express my uncertainty about this position by large variances, the landmark assignment is based not on the second moments, but on the first moments, on my estimated position and orientation. And so from our scanner, I will get those detected poles, and then the procedure will do some assignment of landmarks in the vicinity, and it will probably even assign this cylinder here, which is a completely wrong match. And based on this wrong match, the Kalman filter will compute the correction, and this will lead most probably to a completely wrong trajectory. So even though in general it would be okay to model my uncertainty in this way, the problem in our case is that the observations which I need in the correction step are not absolute in nature, but I obtain them based on my current estimation of the position and orientation of my robot. Now here's an idea to overcome this problem. So if I don't know where I am, what if I assume some random position and orientation? Then I could do the landmark assignment for each of those hypothetical poses of my robot. So I would not only try this here, but also this. And then eventually this position here would lead to the best match between detected landmarks and landmarks in the map. So by starting with many, many such poses instead of just one, there would be the chance that one of those poses is close to my real pose. And so the landmark association would give the best results so that ultimately I would be able to identify the correct pose among all those hypothetical poses. And so this is one of the basic ideas behind the particle filter. Now in a particle filter, we do have particles. And so we represent our belief by a set of random samples. And so this is an approximate representation and it's non-parametric and it is able to represent distributions with multiple modes. So each of those particles is a hypothetical state and our belief is represented by the set of particles where m is a large number, for example, m maybe 1000. And so if this is our true belief, which we want to represent, our particles may look like that. Here may be one, here, here may be a few more. Here's the peak, so there should be many particles here. Now the density of those particles approximates our true belief. So now if you have a simple distribution and want to obtain the particles that represent this distribution, for example, a normal distribution, then you would just sample them according to the distribution and return the set of samples. On the other hand, if we have a set of particles, we can compute the first and second moment. So our estimated mu will be one divided by m times the sum of all samples. So this is the mean value. And the estimation for our variance would be one divided by m minus one times the sum of x minus the estimated mean squared. So assuming that our particles are, for example, sampled from a normal distribution, we can estimate the mu and sigma of that normal distribution, where of course the more particles we have, the better our estimate will be. However, if the particles do not represent a normal distribution, then we still get this first and second moment, but the distribution represented by our particles will be different from the normal distribution that is defined by our estimated mean and variance. So now let's have a look at the particle filter prediction step. And I want to compare this with the discrete base filter, which we had earlier. So in the discrete base filter, the update step was given as follows. For all xt, we computed our predicted belief using that sum over all xt minus 1 of the probability of ending up in xt when we were at xt minus 1 and given the control ut times the belief of xt minus 1. That's all there was to do in the update step. And that was a convolution. So if our old belief looked like that, 
Then for every discrete value, we multiply that value with this probability, which also was given at discrete raster positions only. And so for example, we place this here, then we had this value, place this here. And so in the end, we added all this up and obtained something like that. And so we had five discrete values here, convoluted by three values, and we obtained seven discrete values here. So the result of the convolution is a widening of our distribution, or we could say non-scientifically, it's a smearing by convolution. And now in the particle filter, our distribution is represented by the set of particles. And the update step looks pretty similar. We now do for every particle the following. We sample a particle for our predicted belief according to the distribution of this probability, which is the probability that I end up in xt if my previous state was exactly the mth particle of my particle set and the given control was ut. So again, say this is my old belief, but this is now not represented by this curve, but rather by a set of particles. And now in this loop, I take every single particle, say for example, this particle here, which may be particle i, and I take this probability, which is the same as here. And for this particle, the probability of the new state will look like that. And so I move this particle to here, but not exactly to the center, but I now sample from this distribution. Say I pick this point here, and I do so for every point. Say this is my next particle I want to look at. Then this is the probability. I will sample from this probability. Say I pick this point, and so on for every single particle. And now you see what we achieved here by a convolution with those probabilities is achieved here by a sampling from this distribution. So again, non-scientifically, we could say we do a smearing by sampling. But the smearing is controlled by exactly the same term in the particle filter and in the discrete base filter. Now to give an example in 2D, if my robot is here, the particles would look like this, and my control would move the robot like that. Then I would have to append this vector here, but I would have to apply noise. Say my distribution would be like that, then I would sample from that distribution. And I would apply the same vector here, get this distribution, sample from it, and so on. And so this would be my new particle set. So let's think about this sampling step. So how do we get this probability? What we do have so far is, we know if our robot is somewhere and we execute some control, ut, consisting of left and right motor ticks, we end up in a new position. And in our last unit, we already implemented this formula. Our new position x prime is a function g of our old position or state and our control. And now here, this is our particle x t minus one m. This is our control left t and right t. And this is our new particle x t over line n. Now this is an exact function, however the movement according to the control is inexact. And so we implement this formula above here in the following way. Given l t and u t, we assume that l and t are normal distributed. And so we sample l t prime according to a normal distribution of l t with the variance sigma l. And we sample the right control in the same manner. And after we sample this, we will compute the new particle by the exact formula using the sampled control. So as you see, the only difference to the exact formula is that the left and right control is not taken as is, but it is sampled according to a distribution which is centered at the left and right control. So how do I determine the variance? And fortunately, we don't have to think about that because in the previous unit, you remember we set up those two equations for the left and right variance, namely a factor alpha one times the left control squared plus alpha two times left minus right squared. And the reasoning was that the variance depends on the driven distance and also on the difference of the left and right track and the same for the right variance. And so this is all there is to do, compute the left and right variances, use those to sample the left and right control, and then compute the new particle from the old particle by applying the exact movement formula using the sampled control. So here's the code for the particle filter. And many things will look very familiar because they are very similar to the Kalman filter code which we had in the last unit. So this is the particle filter class. The constructor doesn't take a state and covariance anymore. Instead, it takes a number of initial particles 
Otherwise, it is the same as the constructor in the Kalman filter class. It takes the robot constants, width and displacement, and the control motion factor and control turn factor. And it stores all that in member variables. So down here is the function G for the state transition. And this is just copied from the Kalman filter class, with the exception that down here I return a tuple instead of a numpy array, so that we don't have to import numerical Python this time. Now here comes the prediction function you'll have to implement. It takes the control, which is left and right, and then here you have to program the steps we just discussed, and I've put some additional hints as comments here. In particular, take care if you call the function random gauss, it takes the standard deviation here as a second argument and not the variance. Here's another function I programmed which prints out the particles using a small header PA. So this also goes into the log file and you will see shortly that the log file viewer now is able to plot all the particles that we output here. Now let's go to the main function. As usual, here is the initialization of some robot constants and of the control motion factor and control turn factor and these are exactly the same values as those that we used in the Kalman filter. And now I need to generate some initial particles. So in this case I use 300 particles and here's my measured state and my standard deviations for x, y and the heading. And then I just do a loop for all 300 particles. I append one particle which is sampled in x, y and heading where the distributions are centered on the elements of the first tuple and the standard deviations are picked from the second tuple. So after that I have 300 particles and I hand them over to the particle filter class together with all those constants. And now down here is the main loop. It reads all control data and then loops. And in the loop we have our usual conversion of the motor ticks to millimeters and then we just call predict. So this call replaces the old particles in the particle filter by a new set of particles which are then printed out and then we take the new control and again replace the old particles by new particles and so on. So now you'll have to implement this predict function up here. So after you implemented this, run it and it will write a log file called particle filter predicted. Load this file and so you will see the following. Here is our initialization of our 300 particles in the upper right corner. Now as we move our time, the distribution gets wider and wider until after a while it seems completely random. However, let us load the reference trajectory. Now you can nicely see how the particles are kind of centered around the reference trajectory for a while until the distribution gets so wide that no structure is visible anymore. This is not surprising since for now we just implemented the prediction and so we still have to implement the corrections.